and thank you to all of you for coming to this talk today. Um, so I am going to give a kind of cognitive neuroscience talk that's about the mechanisms that underpin social learning. But in its sort of raw essence, I think this is really a talk about how amazing it is to be human. Isn't it amazing to be human? Yeah, don't you think it's amazing to be? Of course you do. Of course you think it's amazing to be human because you have spent your day here today having this kind of group intellectual conversation, learning from each other about cutting edge science. And no other species on the planet has spent their day in this way today. Sure, some of the other species are quite cool, Leaf cutter ants, for example, can build cities and they do farming. They have these little kind of conveyor belts, these little assembly lines with different casts doing different jobs. So leaf cutter ants are pretty cool, but no other species comes close to having the richness and complexity of culture that humans have. We have these cultural artifacts, if you like, like ballet, like science, like cookery, like carpentry, that no other species has. Um, and there's a whole literature on this, a whole literature about what is it that makes humans amazing? What is it that makes humans special compared to other non-human species? And the academics, that feed into this literature broadly agree that the thing that makes humans special is that we have cumulative cultural evolution. So young ballet dancers, they don't need to invent ballet from scratch during their lifetime. They can just learn it from the previous generation and spend their time improving on the techniques and then pass that on to the next generation. So the question about what is it that makes humans special becomes the question of, well, why do humans have cumulative cultural evolution on a level that's unparalleled in the animal kingdom? And academics in this discipline broadly agree that the answer to this question is that humans are really good at social learning. We can learn information from each other with high fidelity and minimal information loss. So you're starting to see social learning is a very important topic. So what is social learning and why are we humans so good at it? Well, social learning comprises learning via observation of or interaction with others. And this stands in contrast to what you might call non-social learning. I'm also gonna call this individual learning. I'm gonna use non-social and individual interchangeably in this talk. And this is, learning via trial and error, figuring things out for yourself. Now, in this field, some academics argue that humans are really good at social learning because we have specialized mechanisms in our brains that are specifically for social learning. So in other words, at some point in evolutionary history, we had to develop these special mechanisms to deal with the complexity of social life. On the other side of the debate, however, some academics argue that that is not true. Actually, we just have domain general learning mechanisms. It doesn't matter whether we're engaging in social learning or non-social learning, but we're using the same general mechanisms, things like Pavlovian conditioning and associative learning. So you see that we have this kind of tension between the domain specific account on the one side and the domain general account on the other. Now, in the last 10 years or so, there has been a huge explosion of cognitive neuroscientific studies of social learning. And you might think, well, this is perfect. Cognitive neuroscientists can just look in the brain and look to see whether there are specialized mechanisms for social learning. When you look at this literature, you see that some studies support the domain general view. So these studies show that when people are engaged in social learning, they're using the same dopamine mediated brain areas and algorithms that they use when they're engaged in learning from their own personal experience. On the other hand, 
We also have studies that support the domain specific view, which basically show that there are dissociable neural mechanisms and other types of dissociation between social and non social learning. So the cognitive neuroscience literature at present can't easily solve this debate. What I would like to do in this talk is first to look at some of those dissociations in a bit of detail. So these are patterns of data that are really difficult to reconcile with the domain general view, and they support the domain specific view. But then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to suggest a kind of alternative explanation where I'm going to argue that in many of these studies, the individual source of information is kind of primary and the social source is kind of secondary. Hopefully that will make sense when we get to it. And then I hope to end by trying to resolve some of the conflicts in the literature. So I'm going to start by talking about some dissociations between social and non-social learning. It's gonna feel for the next five minutes like I've completely gone off on a tangent and I'm doing another talk, but don't worry, I'm gonna bring it back to social learning, just bear with me. First of all, I would like you to play a little game with me. If you're scared of flying, maybe just put your fingers in your ears for the next minute, because what I would like you to do is to imagine that you are on an aeroplane, right? So you're on this plane, very nice plane, isn't it? And you look out the window and you're flying over this beautiful winter landscape. So you see snow and you see these beautiful snow covered trees everywhere. Absolutely gorgeous. But you hear this terrible sound coming from the back of the plane and your worst fears are realized and the plane crash lands into this winter landscape. You happily are absolutely fine. So you get out the plane, you've got all your arms and limbs intact. And what you notice is that all of these kind of items are sort of exploded from the plane and there's a little red backpack handily landed at your feet. What I want you to do is, you've got one minute for this game, I want you to choose three items that you're gonna put in your red backpack to help you to survive in the winter landscape. It's a kind of weirdly magical backpack, so it doesn't matter how big the items are, you can still only have three of them. So I'm gonna time you on my phone for a minute, and then you're gonna have a list of three items that will help you to survive in the winter landscape. Okay, 10 seconds left. Did he pack the backpack? Okay, right. So now two of your colleagues appear from the other side of the airplane and you decide that your chances of survival are gonna be greatly increased if you work together as a group. So I want you to get together with two or three, it doesn't really matter, people that are sitting near you and decide as a group, what are you gonna put into the red backpack? So you have to empty out your existing things and put some new things in. Um, and you've only got one minute, go. No, only three things in the backpack, three for the whole group. You got 30 seconds left.
10 seconds left. Three, two, one. Okay, all right. Stop, put your backpacks down. That's it, end of game, right? So, so you should have a list of things that you personally would choose to put in the backpack and the list of things that you've agreed as a group to put in the backpack. I just want you to keep those lists in mind just for one minute and I'm gonna come back to that in a second. First, I want to introduce you to the first topic of dissociation. It's a personality trait that dissociates social and non-social learning. And this topic is the personality trait dominance. So dominant individuals like this guy here, for example, they tend to be leaders in the workplace. They're very good at getting themselves into positions of power and influence. And in general, dominant people seem to get whatever it is that they want. So we, <laughs> so we have this stereotypical view of dominant individuals that they ignore other people and they just do what they want to do. And actually, if you look at the organizational psychology literature, they often use tasks like the winter survival tasks to identify dominant individuals because dominant individuals are people that get what they want into the group backpack. So if you think about the two lists that you have in your head, if they look quite similar, that might give you a little bit of insight about your personality. I should say that you should totally disregard this because that sort of task you're supposed to do with complete strangers not people that might one day be your new boss or that you, <laughs> that you just met and had a really friendly coffee with over lunch. So disregard the results of today. I just wanted you to get into the concept of dominance. Um, so we have these kind of stereotypical views of dominance, but if we look at the animal literature, we actually see a very different picture. We see that in the animal literature, dominant individuals tend to be avid social learners. So this guy here, who's the alpha male, he's very likely to learn by sitting back and watching the actions of the other individuals in the troop. So he's a social learner. So it seems that we have a kind of conflict again between our stereotypical views where dominance is associated with low levels of social learning and the view that we get from the animal literature where dominance is associated with high levels of social learning. And in the first study that I'm going to talk you through, we just wanted to try to measure this in humans and see whether we saw a pattern that was like our stereotypes or more like what we can read in the animal literature. So to measure social learning in humans, we used a computerized task based on one developed by Tim Behrens and Matthew Rushworth and colleagues at the University of Oxford. And this is a really important task to understand because it is the task that has been really widely used in the cognitive neuroscience of social learning. Nearly every study in this literature is a kind of variation of this task. So if I haven't explained it clearly, please ask me questions. So in this task, on each trial, what you have to do as a participant is make a choice. Are you going to go with the blue box or are you going to go with the green box? The correct answer is revealed in the middle and you get some points if you get the answer right and points make prizes in this game. So if you get to the silver goal, you get two pounds to take home. And if you get to the gold goal, you get four. Before you make your choice, you see a red frame which, rep which surrounds one of the two boxes and which represents social information. But you are told as a participant that this information has been mixed up in its order so that sometimes it's going to go through phases where it's very useful. For example, trials from the end of the experiment where the other people really understood how the game worked. And sometimes it's going to go through periods where it's not very useful. You are also told that the correct answer is going to flip throughout the course of the experiment between blue and green. So you know that you need to keep track of these changing probability schedules like this. So our participants played this task and then we analyzed the data in the following way. We used what's called a Bayesian learner model and we used this in two slightly different ways. So the first thing that we did with the Bayesian learner model was to feed into it information about those blue and green outcomes. So when you do this, 
the model estimates the underlying probability that a blue choice is going to result in additional points. And so the model is solving the task as if it is an optimal learner, but someone who is purely playing the game based on the outcome information, somebody that didn't even see the social information. So it is an optimal individual learner. The second thing that we did with the model was to feed into it information about the accuracy of the social advice and also the advice that it gave. And so when you do that, then the model is essentially solving the task in an optimal fashion, but as if it is somebody who is really learning about the utility of the social information and going with it when it's likely to be correct and going against it when it's not likely to be correct. So someone that's solving the task purely based on the social information. So the model is an optimal social learner. We then regress these two optimal models against participants' actual responses to give us beta values for each participant representing the extent to which they're an optimal individual learner and the extent to which they're an optimal social learner. What we want to know is to what extent these beta values are related to how dominant a person is in their everyday life. And to figure out somebody's dominance, we gave them a questionnaire which was validated against the winter survival task. So we know that people that score highly on this dominance questionnaire are people that get what they want into that red backpack. <clears throat> but we also know that people do this using different methods. So some people are socially dominant, so they might use tactics such as making alliances, using rational argument and using pro-social gestures. And other people might be what you might say is aggressively dominant. So they might use tactics such as threat, deceit, flattery, and aggression. I'm sure we can all think of examples in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and for each participant, we had a measure of both social and aggressive dominance. What we found was that social dominance was a significant positive predictor of social learning betas. So individuals that were high in terms of social dominance were really using that social information to help them make decisions on the computerized task. Whereas aggressive dominance was a significant negative predictor of social learning betas. So these individuals here that are high in terms of aggressive dominance, they're not actively going against the social information, they're just disregarding it. They're just not using it to help them make decisions. So in a very post hoc way, you could say that what we have here is a pattern that is similar to that animal view where you see that positive relationship between dominance and social learning for social dominance. But for aggressive dominance, you have a pattern that is more similar to our stereotypes. And a post hoc explanation would be that our stereotypes are perhaps more based on aggressive dominance because aggressive dominance is very salient in our day-to-day -day interactions. So because of how salient it is to interact with an aggressively dominant person, that probably is going to feed into your stereotypes a bit more. Sure, that's just post hoc. We can talk about that um, later on if you're interested in this particular dominance relationship. But what I think is really interesting about this data set is the fact that although we saw this relationship between dominance and social learning, we didn't see a relationship between dominance and individual learning on this task. And furthermore, we saw that social and aggressive dominance were significantly better predictors of social learning than they were of individual learning. So what that means is that we have a dissociation between social and individual learning. So in other words, we have this relationship between dominance and social learning, but no relationship between dominance and non-social learning. So it's quite difficult to sort of understand these results unless you think that there is something special, something separate, something different about social learning. So dominance is our first example of a dissociation. 
You could also look in the wider literature and see many other similar examples. So this is a study by Inti Brazil's group in the Netherlands, where he shows that social potency, which is a, 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 a subpart of psychopathy, is associated with social learning, but not with individual learning on the same sort of task. So we could have another example that comes from the psychopathy literature. If we look at the first study where they developed this task, they asked people to uh, lie in the scanner while they completed the social learning task. And they found that learning about the utility of that social information was associated with activity in a particular network of brain regions focused on the temporoparietal junction and the anterior cingulate gyrus, whereas learning from one's own experience was associated with activity in a dissociable neural pathway focused on the um, ventral striatum and the anterior cingulate sulcus. So you might say that we have a neural dissociation between social and non-social learning. So we're like starting to build up quite a list of dissociations. I'm not just going to go through dissociations for the whole talk because that's just going to be so boring. But I am going to give you one more example, and this time, this time in terms of a neurochemical dissociation. So this is a study that I ran when I was a postdoc in Roshan Kuhl's lab. And we were interested in the neurochemical basis of social learning. So we asked participants to complete the social learning task that I've already described to you um, on two separate days. And on one day, they took a placebo. And on the other day, they took methylphenidate. So methylphenidate acts on the dopamine system. <clears throat> Normally, the dopamine transporter, this yellow protein here, moves unbound dopamine from the synapse back into the sending neuron. But if you give participants Ritalin or methylphenidate or cocaine, but we didn't do that, then you block the dopamine transporter, causing dopamine to build up in the synapse. So if participants have had methylphenidate, they've got more dopamine sloshing around in their synapses. It's a very messy, inaccurate way to say it. Um, so we gave participants methylphenidate, we gave them this task, we analyzed the data in a slightly different way from how I've described to make use of developments in the literature at that time. Because at this period, people had started to show that in volatile periods where things are changing a lot, people tend to have higher learning rates compared to when they're learning in stable periods or stable environments where things are not changing very much. And this makes some sense because in a volatile period, if you have a prediction error, so say that you think that the social advice is gonna be useful, but it's not, that prediction error might really signal a shift in the underlying probability schedule. So you'd better learn from that prediction error. It's good for you to have a high learning rate in a volatile situation. Whereas in a stable situation, sometimes you're gonna have prediction errors because this is a probabilistic task. But ideally, you wouldn't change your underlying belief based on those prediction errors. So to capture this development in the literature in our analysis, we took a classic Raskola Wagner model and we adapted it so that we could estimate learning rates for volatile and stable periods for both social learning and individual learning at the same time. I am going to show you the results on a graph where I'm actually going to be showing you the difference in learning rate between volatile and stable periods. So what we found was that there was a drug by volatility by learning source interaction, such that when participants had taken methylphenidate, which you can see in red, compared to when they're taken placebo, which you can see in blue, they were better at adapting their learning rate to suit the current level of environmental volatility. So this was a kind of adaptive change that participants underwent when they took methylphenidate. But this was only true for non-social learning about those blue and green boxes, and methylphenidate had no effect on social learning about that red frame. So what we have here is another example of a dissociation. And I should say that 
Some people don't like computational modeling because they think it's kind of spooky and magical. So we also analyze the data using a more simple winstow lu shift model. Um, and again, we saw the same results. So now we have a whole bunch of dissociations. So a whole bunch of patterns of data that make it look like there must be something special about social learning because we've got effects that are on social learning and not on non-social learning or vice versa. So I said that in the second part of the talk, I was going to offer an alternative explanation. And what I'm going to argue here is that in many of these paradigms that have been used, the individual source of information is a kind of primary source, whereas the social source of information is kind of secondary or additional. So why do I think that the individual source of information is primary in this task? Well. I think it's primary because the individual information, it appears first on the screen. It's highly salient. So it comprises these big colorful boxes as opposed to this thin red frame. And it's in the same frame of reference as the outcome information. So in other words, the outcome information comes in the form of a little blue or a little green box. And that primarily tells you on this trial, the blue box has been rewarded, or on this trial, the green box has been rewarded. And from that, you have to then look at where the red frame is and secondarily infer that the red frame must have also therefore been rewarded. So this means that this dissociation between non-social and social might really be a dissociation between primary and secondary. So we reasoned that if we had a control task where participants learned from a primary source and a secondary source, and neither of them were social in nature, and if we didn't see this same methylphenidate driven dissociation on the control task, then we could be more confident that this dissociation represents a distinction between individual and social and not primary and secondary. So to do that, we recruited a second group of participants and we gave them a control task where we told them that the red frame, nothing to do with social, we didn't even mention social, we told them that it was the output from a system of rigged roulette wheels and we had a cover story that made them understand that it would also go in phases where sometimes it would be useful and sometimes it would be not very useful. And again, they took placebo and methylphenidate. So I want to show you the results from the roulette group side by side with the results from the social group so that you can visually compare. So what I've done is to take this difference here and represent that in orange and this difference here and represent that in green. And so what I'm showing is that anything above that dotted line is a boost in performance as an effect of taking methylphenidate. And so just to remind you, for the people that had the social cover story, methylphenidate boosted their ability to modulate their learning rate to suit environmental volatility, but this was only for learning from the primary source, the non-social information, and it didn't affect learning from the secondary source, the social information. Now I'm going to show you the roulette results, but before I do, I wanna just think about some hypothetical data so that we can keep this related to theory. So if we saw data that looks like this, then we would be seeing that methylphenidate affects all types of learning except for learning from the secondary source when it is social in nature. So this would support the domain specific view because it would mean that it really is something about the social nature of that information that kind of protects it against the effects of methylphenidate. So it's something about the social specificity of it. If, however, we saw some data that looked like this, this would not support the domain specific view because here we would be seeing that methylphenidate affects learning from primary sources. It doesn't affect learning from secondary sources, but it also doesn't care whether the secondary source is social or non-social in nature. Indeed, we saw a pattern of data that looked like the latter. So we had no significant interaction between drug 
learning source and the social roulette cover story, and Bayesian statistics provided moderate to strong evidence to support the conclusion that the data from the social and the roulette groups were comparable. So going back to this debate, this means that we now have to draw question marks all over the domain specific view. Um, because our control task really forces us to question this, and this is because many studies that have supported this domain specific view have not used a similar control task, and therefore they might be showing dissociations, not between social and non social learning, but actually they might be dissociations between learning from a primary source and learning from a secondary source. So that's interesting that we have to question the domain specific view, but we haven't really provided positive evidence to support the domain general view either. And the reason why we haven't got this evidence from this study is because we didn't see an effect of the drug on social learning. So we couldn't possibly have shown that social learning and non-social learning are sharing a similar mechanism that we're disrupting because we didn't see a disruptive or a facilitatory effect on social learning. We just saw no effect on social learning. So we have to question this view, but we still can't really support this domain general view, okay? Well, what we do know from that study is that the dopaminergic drug, it affected non-social learning, which was the primary learning source in this situation. So if we could make the social source of information into the primary source of information, then surely we should see an effect of the dopaminergic drug on social learning then. And this would help us to test the domain general view, because if the domain general view is correct, both social and non-social learning should be modulated by dopaminergic drugs when they are primary sources of information. Five minutes, crikey. Spent way too long on the winter survival task. So what we did is to make a new version of the task where the social information is the primary source. In this version of the task, participants first see the social information, which comes in the form of a highly salient big red box. And this represents the uh, group's choice. And they have to decide, are they going to go with the group or are they going to go against the group? They also see a thin blue and a thin green frame, which either surrounds the red box or not. And they know, again, that things are going to happen in phases. So sometimes going with the group is going to be rewarded, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes the blue frame is going to be rewarded. Sometimes it's going to be the green frame. Feedback comes in the same frame of reference as the social information. So it is a tick or a cross that tells you whether going with the group was the correct thing to do on that trial. So. The social information is now the primary source because it appears first, it's highly salient, and it's in the same frame of reference as the outcome information. We recruited two groups of participants. One did the classic version of the task. Another group did our new version where the social information is primary. And again, we used a counterbalanced double blind uh, drug study. But this time we used a drug called haloperidol. Haloperidol doesn't act on the dopamine transporter, it actually blocks the D2 receptor. So whereas methylphenidate was enhancing the effects of dopamine and resulting in enhanced learning rates to suit the level of environmental volatility, haloperidol should in a way be blunting the effects of dopamine and if anything be resulting in lower learning rates. So we predicted that what we would see is that haloperidol would result in reduced learning rates, but with respect to learning from the primary source of information, and haloperidol shouldn't affect learning from that secondary source of information. And indeed, that's what we saw. So we saw a significant drug by information source interaction, such that the drug affected learning from the primary information sources but not the secondary information sources. I know that that looks like a bit of a facilitatory effect there, but it's not statistically significant. So I wouldn't read too much into that. Importantly for our theory, we also predicted that when we focused in on learning from that primary source, it shouldn't matter whether participants had done the version of the task where the non-social source is primary 
or the new version of the task where the social source is primary, it shouldn't make a difference. The drug should have comparable effects on the two versions of the task. And indeed, that was what we also saw. So Bayesian statistics provided moderate to strong evidence um, to support the idea that there was no drug by inflammation by group interaction. So to summarize my talk, um, I first presented some dissociations between social and non-social learning. However, I then argued that these dissociations may represent differences between primary and secondary learning and not between social and non-social learning. And um, finally, what I hope to do is to try to use this to go back to that broader literature and resolve the conflict a little bit. So this final study that I presented, it gives us that positive evidence that we were inquiring about to support the domain general view, because we showed that both social and non-social learning share a common dopaminergic mechanism. I think that realizing the importance of this distinction between primary and secondary is really important in interpreting the wider literature. And I think this because when you look at these studies that support the domain general view, so studies where social learning is associated with the dopaminergically rich areas of the brain, you see that the social information in these studies is the primary source of information. In many of these studies, the social information is the only thing that people are learning from, and they're not engaging in individual learning at all. On the other hand, when you look at studies that have suggested that there are dissociations between social and non-social learning, you often see that the social source of information is the secondary or additional source of information. And I think that it's probably the case that these neural pathways that we have often thought about as being specialized for social and non-social learning probably deal with both social and non-social cues, but they flexibly switch between the two depending upon whichever cue is primarily relevant for the task at hand. So with that, I would like to finish just by also saying thank you to the people that have actually done all of this work. So thank you very much to Roshan Kool, Hanika Denauden, and the rest of the team at the Donders Institute, um, where we did the methylphenidate study. And thank you to my lab group, where we did the haloperidol study, in particular to Alicia Rabitsky, who led that study. And thank you to all of our funders, and thank you for listening. Well, that's fantastic.